Hello and welcome to episode 124 of Pop Culturally Deprived, where each week we watch a movie I've never seen before, which is most of them, and talk about the good, the Benny, and the Jets. This week we're going to be talking about 27 dresses on your Shiny Mermaid podcast. Almost laughed there, didn't you? I did. <laughs> did you see that? That's why I put. <laughs> <laughs> I had seen it, but I forgot. I was very pleased with myself for that one. <laughs> of course. <laughs> who are you? <laughs> well, before we say who I am, I do want to clarify that I have actually seen Twenty Seven Dresses before. I love this movie. Um, we are still in the middle of our month long. Oh, what are we calling this? Run of movies Matthew has never seen. Yeah, Matthew PCD. So, Matthew PCD, yes, yes. Sounds, sounds like an um, illness. <laughs> <laughs> I am Mandy Kay, and you can find me on Twitter at Mandy Kay if you want to fangirl with me about all of the television fandoms. And I'm Matthew Vose. I don't have 27 dresses. I have a very nice selection of cufflinks from the different weddings where I've been usher or best man over the years. You can find me on Twitter at Matthew Vos. All right, Matthew, if you are someone who has a nice selection of cufflinks, why have you never seen 27 Dresses? Uh, I'm not really into rom-coms as a genre. And and that feels like the most stereotypically blokey thing. Ugh, chick flicks. (laughs) Like, I, I feel like I've seen a number and gone, okay, I will see them when they're on or someone else is interested in seeing them. And this is not one that anyone was interested in seeing. This is not one that particularly hit my radar. And the setup for it seemed very, okay, we get it. So it just never grabbed me. Um, But this was the one that I think we both agreed when we went through the list of what films we could cover. was like, oh, that would be an interesting one to talk about. Yes. So both of us were interested in talking about this one. Okay. Let's talk rom-coms. Because I'm I'm going to keep trying to use the word rom-com. Because that is a genre. How many times can we say rom com? Well, absolutely, but that is a genre. Like romance and comedy, or romance comedies, are, are separate things. Yes. I, I was chatting to Catherine and saying, like, you know, Emily is a romance that is a comedy, but it's not a rom com. Right. So rom com, I think, is a is a different thing. Can you talk to me a bit about rom coms? What makes a good rom com for you? Your favourites in the genre? Let's start with a high point. <laughs> Okay, so first and foremost, I think we talked about this last week too. For me, a rom-com, actually by definition, a rom-com has to have the happily ever after. Um, So ultimately, I think a rom-com is a lighthearted, funny movie that has a romance at the core where the couple ends up together at the end. Oh, interesting. Okay. And for me, it has to have all three of those things for it to be a rom-com. And so I actually looked at a bunch of... Um, best romantic comedies of all time list. And there were so many movies on those lists that I'm looking at, like, that's not a rom-com. Like, yeah. why is it in this list? Like, half of them listed Amelie. And I'm like, that's not mm. really a rom-com. They all list Bridesmaids. That's not a rom-com to no, me. they have a romance in them. Yes. Yeah. Singing um, singing in the Rain is not a rom-com. Exactly. Um. So then if, if we're going to talk... Rom-coms that I love, mm. Dirty Dancing absolutely goes at the top okay. of the list. Absolutely. Um, closely followed by Pretty Woman. Um, but I couldn't really narrow it down, so I've got a quick little list here for you. Okay. Um, and I'm Whoa. curious how many of these you've seen. Okay. Um, so these are all ones that I love. How to Lose a Guy in 10 Days. Seen you've it. Got Mail. Not seen it. Seen the original. Uh, Notting Hill. Not seen it. Music and Lyrics. Not seen it. America's Sweethearts. Not seen it. The Holiday. Seen it. Live down the road from it. <laughs> <laughs> Two weeks notice. Oh, I've seen it. Ah, oh. And then <laughs> if we include teen movies and musicals, which I consider to be different, um, we do still have a few that fit kind of the formula. Mm-hmm. So 10 Things I Hate About You. Seen it. Grease. Seen it. And Clueless. Seen it. Love it. All right. So that's, what was that about? Like half? Yeah, about half. Seen? Yeah, yeah. Um, the interesting thing about that list, though, is that there's really nothing recent on it. Um, 
I feel like rom-coms really kind of disappeared for a while there. And that's when we got stuff like Bridesmaids. Um, Apart from Hallmark movies, which I think single-handedly has kept the genre alive. Mm. Um, Netflix is certainly reviving it. We had a comment on Twitter from at License to Mock. Um, and, and she said, between things like Set It Up and Always Be My Maybe, it feels like Netflix is single-handedly trying to resurrect the genre. Yeah. And I absolutely agree. They yeah. also had um, a lot of success with A Christmas Prince and A mm-hmm. Christmas Prince 2. Now, I, I, I think, I wonder if part of this is because, and, and 27 Dresses is a really interesting point to discuss this. There is a thing at the end of the 2000s. So around the time this comes out and a few years after where rom-coms suddenly switch and, and people, I think, are so clued up to them. I mean, you, you say two weeks notice. That stands out to me as the most stereotypical rom-com. It follows the beat by beat of everything you would expect from a romantic comedy. Um, okay. But people kind of clue up what makes a rom-com and what those beats are. So the people who grew up with them, who were making films at that point, then start playing with the genre more and you get things like easy a um high fidelity is a little earlier but high fidelity um scott pilgrim juno films that aren't necessarily Mm rom-coms but do carry some of that this is the sort of film that we would have or the the audience is not too dissimilar necessarily but they start messing around with it i don't have too many great examples for this but I feel like it kind of does that transition of actually let's evolve the genre into something a little different and perhaps even write it more. Um, it's not just about uh, the very stereotypical young woman in the city trying to find her way and do a thing. Right. It can be about people of different ages, different situations. Um, I I think a good example of that is, is one that we were going to slightly mention later. It's mm. another Catherine Heigl movie. Um, after she did this, she did um, Knocked Up. Uh, before this, I think. Was it before this? Mm. Yeah, actually, you're right. It was before this. That one does show up on some rom-com lists, but I feel like it has, at that point, it has started shifting from the stereotypically formulaic rom-com. Absolutely. And, and I, th- I think this is why 27 Dresses is interesting, because it's trying to be the, the you know, they have a meet cute, they but they're two very different people. Eventually they get close, they have a conflict, they then have to resolve the conflict and end up together. Those, mm-hmm. you know, very standard beats. I feel like this is a film that's trying to do that too late. If this film had come out 2002, everyone would love it. Yeah, this one, when I think about rom-coms in the theater, this one always strikes me as one of the last ones that mm. I saw. Yeah. That really fit into the genre the way it has traditionally been known. Because I did. I, I saw 27 Dresses in the theater. Nice. On your own? Because of course with I With a partner? Did. No, I went with a friend. Okay. And I, I feel like I loved it and my friend did not like it. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. I feel like this is one of those movies where people have very specific opinions about it. Yeah. I, I would agree, and I think we're going to get into that in a bit. Uh, so you asked on Twitter uh, earlier this week uh, for folks to tell us kind of what their opinions of rom-coms are, what their favorite ones are, what makes a rom-com a rom-com, all of the same things that we're talking about right now. Mm. And uh, we one of our first responses came from Anna at Anna underscore MCG. And she said, a good rom-com has likable main characters and a rootable romance. Meg Ryan did rom-coms at their best. Heigl did them at their worst. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I love the phrase rootable romance. And that is absolutely bang on. Yeah, you have to want them to be together and you have to see why they would be good together. Yes. Mm. Um, I really like the reply from uh, our friend Rachel at Farflung Hope 5. Uh, she said, I have a complicated relationship with rom-coms. I don't like a lot of them because the plots feel non-existent. I prefer a rom-com that focuses on a character who happens to meet or fall for someone rather than the relationship is the sole story. Um, asking for a bit more clarification. Uh, and partially because there was a tweet recently about how we accept films like Die Hard and Taken and The Fast and the Furious as being like, oh, yeah, it's good, silly fun. But yet chick flicks, in inverted commas, we expect to be 
you know, excellent or they're the worst thing of all of cinema ever. You know, we, we can't stand them. So I did wonder mm-hmm. if that was part of it. Um, asking for clarification, she said, I feel as if perhaps I am asking too much of a genre that is just as supposed to be fun. And I am being a fuddy-duddy. Great use of fuddy-duddy. <laughs> <laughs> but I have just never cared for them uh, overall, except a handful. I also wonder if we're trained to expect less from rom-coms because they are chick flicks, in inverted commas, ostensibly for and about women, much like the bad rap given to romance novels and young adult. Uh, I'd agree, I think. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I think that's curious because somebody else responded on um, Twitter about they had never seen 27 Dresses. um, But given their experience being a bridesmaid, they didn't think they would particularly enjoy it. Mm. And my response was, well, I think it's a really great movie, but my standards for rom-coms are decidedly lower than for other movies. Mm. And I don't think I quite realized that until I started going through this thought process to prepare for this conversation. I am almost guaranteed to like a rom-com just by virtue of it being a rom-com. Mm. Yeah, you talked last week about if it sticks that landing, the happy ever after. Yeah. You're okay. Mm-hmm. Mm. I, I, there's a really good rant that Mark Commode does about movies in this way, about saying, and, and I think... 27 Dresses is one of these, these kind of spreadsheet movies. We're going to make a movie for $30 million and it's going to make us $150 million. Right. Uh, and he does a whole thing of, yes, your expectations could be low because they're actually, you know, they, they know what they want out of the film as the studio making it. But if you're going to make a movie that does that, why not make it a good one? If you're going to make Taken 3, why not make it good? If, uh, and there are examples of this because if you're going to make Mad Max 4... If you make it good, it then surpasses itself. It becomes something even more. And people talk about it and it becomes a film that everyone says, you must go and see this film. And and examples such as Terminator 2. You know, Terminator 2 does not need to be anything more than slightly horror action thriller thing. Right. But it is an action film that is still talked about today because it was such a, you know, well done film. Right. Yeah. And it's a shame that rom-coms and chick flicks in general, I don't think, get that. E- even the sort of, you know, very popular ones at the moment, the, the crazy, rich Asian, crazy Rich Asians still gets the, but it's fine. It's just a happy, warm blanket to wrap yourself up in. Mm-hmm. I think. Do you think? Do you think it's nice? It's that We shouldn't have these expectations? I... I prefer to be pleasantly surprised when my low expectations are exceeded. Okay. I think that's kind of where, like, I I want to go in and enjoy it, and I would rather exceptionally enjoy something that does the film better than that low bar, got but it. I want to enjoy all of it. Rather than going in going, right, this has got to impress me. This has got to push the envelope of the genre forward. Yes. Okay. I mean, this is why, like, we talk about this around Christmas time. I love Hallmark Christmas movies. Mm. And they are literally the same. All you have to do <laughs> is swap in one of the five Caucasian blonde actresses that Hallmark uses with one of the five Caucasian brunette male actors that Hallmark <laughs> uses, and then either make them a librarian, a writer, or a baker, or an event planner, and put them together. Right. You know, and I don't care. I like them. Mm-hmm. I do. Like, th- but that's what I mean when I say my, my standards are low. Like, my expectations are low. And so, when something comes along that is the same genre but puts its own spin on it or does it a little bit differently, then I sit up and take notice. Yeah. But I'm still happy to sit there and watch <laughs> a, a Christmas Prince five times in a row. <laughs> you know, nice. I'm gonna do it. And. So. Uh, like the Christmas conversation is a good one because we talked about style versus genre and how you consider Christmas films. Rom-com to me is very much a genre where it's it's telling me what the story is going to be, not what the film is going to be styled as. And very much they're styled as someone working in an office in a city doing a job and meeting people either through their group of friends, through their hobby or through their work. Yes. But it could be a gangster rom-com, it could be a sci-fi rom-com, it could be a... Yeah, outer space fantasy rom-com. <laughs> they're, <laughs> yes. ju- they're just generally not. And I am absolutely here. If someone wants to do a rom-com in a sort of Middle Earth trapping, <laughs> yeah, I'm here for that. 
Yeah. It's funny. I was talking to Joseph last night because I panicked all of a sudden trying to figure out what's my favorite rom-com. Oh, my God. I don't know how to do this. And then, of course, it just clicked. Of course, it's Dirty Dancing. It would never be anything else. And he looked at me and he said, what about The Princess Bride? And I said, that's not a rom-com. And then it showed up on like four out of five of the rom-com list that I looked up. Yeah. I was like, that's interesting. Because it has romance and it has comedy. It does. The, the, it is yeah. a funny movie with a romance at its core where the couple ends up together mm. at the end. But I would never classify it as a rom-com because, it's, to me, it's fantasy. But they're not mutually exclusive. No. I, I'll tell you the, the really interesting thing. and uh, Some of this stands out on your list and a lot of it stands out on the ones that we were offered from other people. Um People coming and suggesting other films they like. At, at Kate Met, What's Your Number, Nick and Nora's Infinite Playlist for a Good Time Call, uh, Moonstruck, you mentioned Pretty Woman. So at Are You Girl Jen says anything with Julia Roberts, particularly late 80s, early 2000s, anything with Hugh Grant. A, a lot of these films, and not all of them to be fair, are very much about the central female protagonist's journey to become more confident, overcome things that were potentially holding her back, and developing friendships. Mm-hmm. There, there is a very strong element of that. I mean, I mean, Dirty Dancing, I'm, I I didn't actually think of as a, as a rom-com. I think you're right. But it is about this sort of coming of age of this person. Okay. Um, yeah. And 10 Things I Hate About You, although, yes, it's got the romance in it, you could absolutely watch it in that way. And the same with Clueless and other things. Mm-hmm. And I, th- I, well, see, I think and that's why I sorry, no, no I, I tend to to put like teen movies like 10 Things I Hate About You and Clueless in a different bucket, mm. because while the romance is central to the plot, ultimately it's coming of age. Yeah, it's becoming who you are as a person through those developmental years as teenagers. Mm. And and so that's why for me I was surprised whenever those movies kept coming up over and over again on the rom com list, and that's why I specified if we're gonna include teen movies, then I'll I'll pick these two. But self development and friendship development is always slightly more than a rom com. Like you don't need those things for a rom com to be a good rom com. But if a rom com has those things, then it does raise that bar. Yeah. I think so. And the, and the one that I hear mentioned and Catherine actually said is one of her favorites is Ever After. I love that movie. I don't think I would have classified it as a rom-com, which is stupid because it's, abs- I mean, it's a fairy tale. Of course it's a <laughs> rom-com. I, huh, that's interesting. But yeah, it is a lot more, and having not seen it, only knowing part of it, but it's a lot more about the growth, development self-rescuing princess elements of the mm-hmm. heroine yes and and i think when you write it and you write it well that's why they appeal more possibly who knows yeah no i don't disagree with that at all shall we dive back into 27 dresses yes that's that's good chat about rom-coms i think because we're watching so many rom-coms this month i definitely wanted to have that conversation with you so thank you yes good conversation 27 dresses is a 2008 romantic comedy would you believe Directed by Anne Fletcher, written by Aline Brosh McKenna, and starring Catherine Heigl and James Marsden. The critical reception for 27 Dresses was mixed, particularly noting the the by-the-numbers rom-com formula, but enjoying the performance of Heigl. Commercially, the film earned $160 million against its $30 million budget. And if you haven't seen it, um, Catherine Heigl... She has to deal with her sister falling in love with the man of her dreams, whilst a journalist writes an article about her being a bridesmaid 27 times without her knowledge. The... That makes it sound like she was a bridesmaid 27 times without her knowledge. I, I did think that just as I was, right, as I was reading it. Because <laughs> <laughs> I'd expected it to be 27 wedding dresses. Like she was a model for, or and certainly when it starts and she talks about how much she loves helping people with their weddings, like she would be a wedding coordinator and she had the prototype version of these dresses for people to choose from. Mm-hmm. And there's not one that's her thing. I, I, I guess I expected the dresses to be more central to the plot, frankly. Okay. <laughs> to give you a spoiler of some of my feelings on it. Right. How were you able to watch this film? Do you own this? Do you own the remastered Blu-ray Steelbook edition? 
Oh, I don't, but okay. I kind of wish I did. <laughs> um, it is available to rent on Amazon. Cool. Um, it's another one. It is available in a few places, but not everywhere over here, weirdly. But it was on TV last Sunday, so I recorded it. Uh, you, Whilst, like I say, you can rent it, it kind of does the circuit on the Freeview channels. So keep your eyes open mm-hmm. in the UK. Yeah, it has been on both Netflix and Hulu here. It's just right. not currently there. Uh. All right. So I'm pretty sure you're familiar with Katherine Heigl, but what is your experience of of her, James Marsden, uh, the director, Anne Fletcher, and the writer, Aline Brush McKenna? Uh, so uh, Katherine Heigl, I would admit I didn't start watching anything of Grey's until way after she left. So although I knew she was on Grey's, I didn't see her in it. Um, Wait, did you never go back to the beginning and start it? No. You just started in the middle and went from there? I started around season 10, which, given the stuff I've read um, Ellen Pompeo saying, actually makes a lot of sense. Um, Okay. uh, Frankly, reading the plots that Catherine Heigl had on Grey's, it's like, yeah, I would never have watched this show. This is ridiculous. This is the most ridiculous of all. Um, I I have seen Knocked Up, but if you had pressed me before reading up on this, um, I would have said that was Elizabeth Banks. I have no memory of Catherine Heigl in that film. Oh, interesting. I mean, it's not a great film anyway. And I've, that's pretty much all I've ever seen her in because, frankly, Catherine Heigl does not pick good films. She is very bad at her project choosing. Um, hmm. so much of it is dreadful films to the extent one of her films is listed as being the lowest grossing film in US history it was opened at one cinema it made $30 and then that got adjusted to $20 because the producers refunded 10 of it to the makeup lady who'd bought her own ticket what movie was that? that is a movie called Zizek's Road Z Y Z Z Y X road. It. Yeah, it was it was at one cinema. It got released like two years after they made it or something. I, I mean, that's an extreme example, but yeah, the list of stuff she's been in, I'm just like, oh, I heard of that. That's supposed to be awful. I've heard of that. That's supposed to be awful. I I don't think she's very good at what she chooses. Whether it's that she was the, <sighs> I'm going to use the expression poor man's, but but you know the the Kate Hudson when you don't have the budget for a Kate Hudson. Or Sandra, mm, Sandra okay. Bullock or Elizabeth Banks or someone like that. When you don't have the budget for them, Catherine Heigl is an option because she's not yet big enough and those were films that never quite made it. Hmm. I think that's interesting because my list of things that I've seen her in are all movies and projects that I loved her in. Okay. Such as? <laughs> um. So the first thing I ever saw her in was a movie that she did when she was a teenager called Wish Upon a Star. Okay. And I, I, I want to say it's a Disney movie, but I'm not sure that it is. Um, but it's about her and her sister, uh, like switching bodies. It's a body switch movie, okay? Essentially, cool. Um, and it's fantastic. And I remember picking it up from the video store, you know, when I was in high school, and I loved it immediately. Mm-hmm. Um, and then she showed up on Roswell, the TV show, right? Which I never watched. And to be fair. I loved her on that. Okay. And so when I saw her in Grey's Anatomy, I loved her there too. Um, and then she started a run of movies, um, like 27 Dresses, Knocked Up, The Ugly Truth with Gerard Butler, Life As We Know It with Josh Duhamel, and Jenny's Wedding uh, with Alexis Bledel. I love all of them. Even The Ugly Truth, which is a terrible movie, but I loved it. Okay. Uh, Jenny's Wedding, 4 out of 10. <laughs> 20% on Rotten Tomatoes. Yeah, I don't... What can I say? I, I liked it. Oh, yeah. And, you know, it, th- these are the sorts of films that appeal to you. So, love what you love. Yeah. I mean, I will say my favorite from that list is Life As We Know It. Okay. I, that one's wonderful. I haven't seen it. Is that the one where they're bounty hunters? Or assassins? No. No. Um, that life as we know it is one where her best friends die and leave behind a child. Okay. And stipulate that their two best friends who are both single will have guardianship of her 
and have to live in the house together for a year before they decide what they're going to do. Okay. Um, so it's it's a very lovely, like, family-centric rom-com, and I think that's why I like it so much. I like the setup. Um, James Marsden, he is obviously Cyclops. I think that was his big break role. Mm-hmm. Um, he's Lois's husband in Superman Returns, which obviously should have been a trilogy unto itself, but fine. Uh, he is the least interesting character in Westworld. Um, and lots of things. I feel like I've just seen him cropping up in lots of stuff, particularly lately, a number of kind of TV things and yeah, kind of bit parts. Yeah, you totally forgot that he's the prince from Enchanted, but I imagine you probably haven't seen Oh, he is. Though. Oh, I have seen Enchanted. I do like Enchanted. Okay. Um, Amy Adams goes a long way. Patrick Dempsey, as much as, again, everything I'm hearing about Patrick Dempsey from Ellen Pompeo. <laughs> it's changing right. my opinion of him, but, you know, he's charming. She's great. Um, Elaine Brush McKenna is the co-creator of Crazy Ex Girlfriend. So as soon as that name came up, I'm like, oh, wow, great. Okay, this could be good. Hmm. So your expectations got higher once yeah. you saw that. And she, okay. and she's the person who wrote the, the certainly the screenplay of um, Devil Wears Prada. Okay. So, you know, she's a big hitter in this in this world. Uh, Anne Fletcher, I have not seen anything else she's done. There are a few films she's directed that I do want to see. Um, Proposal's supposed to be very good. Dumplin's supposed to be very good. Oh, Dumplin's so good. Uh, Hot Pursuit I've seen a bit of and I do not want to see. Because <laughs> it looks... It was bad. It was every bad joke I expected it to be. Um... But she is a very famous choreographer. She did choreography for many, many things I've seen. The Mask. Um, Life Less Ordinary. Lots of stuff on Buffy. Yeah, she and her partner, in fact, uh, what, choreography partner, have done lots of stuff. It's like, oh, wow, they did that. Oh, wow, they did that. Ah, Which is cool. Yeah, I'm actually, I'm looking at that list now. Uh, there's a lot of good movies that she's worked on. Mm. I think her choreograph- choreography partner, he was the one who did the choreography for the Buffy musical. So I would assume she nice. assisted him on that. Yeah. Okay. Nice. All right. Well, you've kind of already given it away, but did you enjoy watching 27 Dresses? I did. I did enjoy this. Uh, again, like last week, the performance was a lot of that. Um, Catherine Heigl particularly sort of sold it very well, and I enjoyed watching her on screen. But I I feel like I can see what the film is trying to do, even though, again, it's kind of being pulled in the wrong direction. I feel like it's going f- got a bit more about it that is delivering some interesting stuff. Mm-hmm. Not necessarily always successfully. Okay. You are allowed your own opinions, of course. Okay. okay. How, how does that differ to your opinion? I mean, I think, I don't know. I think I just accept the movie more for what it is. And and so for me, what it tried to do and what it did are very, very similar. Okay. I think. Um, I mean, there. I think the main thing that I would say doesn't quite work is is specifically the relationship. Oh, God, this is going to sound terrible because it's the core relationship. It's the romance in the movie, and that's what makes a rom-com a rom-com. So I'm going to kind of be go back on what I said. Mm-hmm. But the the story with Jane and Kevin is not quite what you would expect from a rom-com because, one, they don't even start having screen time together until 45 minutes into the movie. And then they really only have one drunken scene together Mm -hmm. at the bar singing Benny and the Jets. It's not like we get this progression of a relationship between the two of them. You know, it's a very short amount of time. They really don't spend that much time together. And then all of a sudden they realize they love each other. And while because my low expectations are are so low for (laughs) rom-coms and they end up together at the end. It makes me happy. I enjoy it. When I start thinking about it logically, it does kind of fall apart, but I don't care. Okay. I I think that's really what it is. I just don't care that it falls apart, but we have to talk about it because that's what we do here. Okay. I feel like we've watched different films. Like they really they meet at that first wedding, and yes, and he but helps briefly. her, and then they meet up again and talk on the phone a couple of times, 
they have the whole scene with her trying on the dresses and him taking photos and talking to her. Mm-hmm. So I feel like they they got a lot early on. They like that that relationship. You know, you're talking about it being called the thing. I feel like it gets a lot of space, and I kind of think you're right. It's not necessarily the right thing on done right. This, this is a film that should end up on that list of films of it's better if she ends up on her own. This does not need to have a delivery of and suddenly she realizes she loves him and they get together. Right. Um, we've seen a few of these where it would have been good for her to go at the end. Actually, yeah, I'm ready to move on from my boss, and I'm, I know why this guy is not the right person for me because he lied to me, didn't tell me the truth about a thing. Mm-hmm. He and I went through that horribly contrived situation about the article, <laughs> which is horribly contrived because um, I don't believe the f- flipping article will get printed with her pictures without some sort of signed agreement from her. Can we print your pictures? Right. Something. Or he has had to absolutely lie and say, yes, those photos are mine. You can print them. And yes, I've got agreement from her. In which case, yes, that's bad. But it, it that that is the moment for me that particularly stands out as we need to hit all the rom-com plot beats. And one of them is that they fall apart at one point so we can reconcile at the end. And that falling apart is actually not very good. It would have been absolutely fine if they slept together and she'd gone but this is a one-time thing. Actually, I'm not that into you in that way. Right. And not forced that romance in there. Well, see, that's interesting because the central conflict of the movie, for me, is actually her and her sister. Oh, absolutely. And it, it's not her and Kevin. And I don't know. I guess you're right. There, there are small moments early on where they are seen together but that that moment with the the 27 dresses like i looked at my watch specifically i wanted to know how much time had passed that was not until 45 minutes into the movie the movie is almost half over before we get the two of them actually starting to build some sort of a relationship even if it's just an acquaintance slash friendship at that point right um which is interesting when one of the definitions for me for a rom-com is that the romance is at the core of the movie. Mm. And it really wasn't in this one. And I, uh, that's why I think I can see what it's trying to do is this interesting story about her and her sister, the years of resentment that's there that she is burying because she is a nice person who has sort of codependent tendencies to try and help other people fix other people and that's what makes her happy and i say that as a massive codependent <laughs> that is very much my style um which i think helps um it, you've reminded me or i've reminded myself uh, our, our friend at messy friend 70 on twitter said that she loves this film uh, it defies logic though i empathize with the character fading to the background putting everyone first um at the end she puts herself first whether we like it or whether or not we like the guy she doesn't. She doesn't like either of the guys because one's horrible, uh, one's stalkery, um, and the, the the pairing doesn't make the journey the movie for her. It's the journey. She could have ended up telling them all to stick it, and I'd have liked it as well. So I like the movie, but not the romance. Right. And, and I think that's absolutely bang on because yeah, if if this film had delivered on that, which reading comments from the writer, I think is what she wanted it to be. About it, it is a kind of coming of age film, although it's hard because coming of age film always makes me think it's about you know teens, mm-hmm. but it's a coming of age film about her actually sort of growing up and saying, No, I'm not going to be here to take care of other people, I'm going to stay in this job because I have a crush on this guy, I have more to offer, so I'm going to go and do that thing, right? And there's bits of the film, which is why I think the direction's good. Like Catherine pointed this out, and it's absolutely true, she's dressed fairly sort of frumpy to begin with. Frumpy might not be the right word. Um, but as the film goes on, she gets a little bit more stylish, more glamorous. She looks better. And the film is sort of trying to show us a bit of how her confidence and her growth is making her look even better. Oh, that's interesting. I did not notice that transition at all. I just remember thinking I love every single outfit she wears in this movie, mm. apart from the bridesmaids' dresses. <laughs> I And I think it's because the ones at the beginning, like Catherine even made a comment of, oh, that's really nice, but it's a very casual work outfit. And then by the mm-hmm. end, she's running around in the nice black outfits. And a part of that's because she's going to weddings and 
right, party yeah. scenes and so on. But even the day to day stuff, she is looking more confident and stylish. Yeah. And it's not that how she looks gives her worth, but it is a nice way to show us how she is feeling about herself. Right. Mm. It's a good character development mm. that we don't have to be told about. But yeah, if, if the, the stuff with the sister was even done even better from both directions, this is not just about Jane. The sister herself needs to have a lot more in this, I think. It's a really good film. I, I, I like what they're doing with that. And I like the fact that James Marsden isn't saving her. Mm-hmm. He is helping her sort of see some of her flaws that I th- the film very heavily implies she already knows about, that she says yes all the time, she can't say no. And even when he has that great scene with her trying to, her practicing saying no to things, he then dupes her at the end and steals her drink. Yes. <laughs> and it's, it, you know, it's not, she's not fixed by his interaction and his work with her, but it helps her see it and it helps her understand how to deal with it. And there could even be a way of resolving the newspaper story in that way, of her reading it and going, wow. I'd never read myself like this and actually reading myself through your words. I can see it. And I can see how I can become better from it. Something like that. Yeah. So they didn't actually explore why she was so upset about the story. Like, was it the content of the story? Was it seeing herself in a way that she had previously not seen and didn't enjoy it? Was it the fact that she thought he lied to her and took advantage of her? Like, they weren't super clear on why she was upset. Mm. And then it got completely overshadowed by her sister. Yeah. I think that taking advantage is the primary thing. That's that's what it's implied to me. But there is also this, you know, uh, we, we saw this in Friends, of course, the imagine the worst side of yourself that you can imagine and you see someone that you love writing it down. Yeah. You know, she, she knows all that. She is a very smart woman. And Catherine Heigl brings across some very smart aspects of the character. So, so like I say, I think I can see what they're going for. I don't see it necessarily always delivers because they then, and again, reading posting interviews, they've sort of taken this idea that was in the film and then gone, but we need this beat and we need this beat and we need it to be a rom-com that's very traditional. Yeah. Which is a shame, but it hasn't overshadowed what quality is there. Uh, what we've not mentioned so far is, of course, the other relationship. The, the, she has this crush on her boss um, that is keeping her in the job, that is making her bend his every whim, such as picking up his dry cleaning, um, which I feel like is, again, a beat from something like a two weeks notice. Certainly, mm-hmm. the, certainly the clothes aspect is a, is a, a absolutely a done thing that we've seen elsewhere. Um, and I can't decide, uh, and I think this is my question for you, whether... He is meant to be a bit crap. So all of those those of us who don't have a crush on him look at the boss and go like, oh God, this guy's... Yes, he's doing great stuff, but he's. it's not like he's Hugh Grant in um, Bridget Jones, which is spectacular right. casting, you know, that she thinks this guy is so, so great. And Hugh Grant comes in at his smarmy best. This guy doesn't have that. He doesn't have that strong a personality and he's not that good looking in that way. Right. So I don't know whether it's just the actor's a bit rubbish and the performance isn't as good, or it's meant to be like that, and we're a bit like, oh, love, come on, you can do better. You're Catherine Heigl. <laughs> do, do you have an opinion on that? Do you think it is intentional one way or the other? I, th- I think the movie doesn't want us to think that he's a bad guy. I think mm-hmm. I struggle with it because Ed Burns feels like a smarmy character to me. Okay. And from what I've seen him and other things, like he was Cameron Diaz's boyfriend slash fiance in the holiday who cheated on her. And, you know, oh, was he? Out. Okay. Um, and so when I think of Ed Burns, I tend to think of him as the quote unquote villain in a rom-com. Right. But I don't think that's what they set him up to be in this. I think because we're meant to root for him and Tess. We're meant to want them to get back together at the end of the movie. Um, you know, when she reintroduces herself to him and he's smiling and Pedro's all like, she's hot. Do you think she'll go for me now? You know, <laughs> it's meant to be cute. Mm. Um, and so we're not supposed to see him as a villain. But I struggle because the relationship that Jane has with him is so inappropriate. It would never, 
ever be appropriate for those two to date mm. because he's her boss, mm. like literally her boss, like direct line of reporting boss. And for that to be the thing that kept her in that job for so long, like I would think if her crush was that big, she would try to find a different job so that she could act on it. And she didn't. Yeah. So that's just really weird to me. But I think the movie played it as if he's generally just a nice guy who's oblivious. And obliviousness comes across sometimes as mean-spirited. Okay. Uh, And I think that's what I don't buy because he's supposed to be this very successful, very good businessman who also gets people to give to charity and does really good works and all this sort of thing. For him to then be oblivious to the people around him. In both Jane's crush on him and Tess's lies at him. Again, just makes him feel feel a bit crap. (laughs) I completely buy that he would be oblivious to Jane. Because Jane has the type of personality where she wants to blend in. Hmm. You know, she is the person who gets everything done so that somebody else can be the center of attention. Mm -hmm. So I buy that completely. The stuff with Tess, less so. um, But mostly, really pretty girls can make you believe whatever they want. You know, and you believe what you want to see. And so he wants to see a beautiful girl who has the same values as him. And so he's going to accept it. Yeah. You know, and, and, and so in some ways I buy it for a movie. Like in, in the real world, no, I wouldn't buy it. Okay. But in a movie, yeah. I do. <laughs> yeah, that's very fair. Okay, so let's talk a bit on Tess. I, I said that there needs to be more from both sides if the sister story aspect is going to be more important. I, I feel mm-hmm. like for me the performance for Tess is what lets down the character. That there, there could be a performance in there, and again, this would probably need to be a um an actress that we know from other things more, but someone who can give a bit more nuance about the fact that her lies are covering something up. She's not just lying because she wants the man, she's lying because there are things going on that we get at the end. That that whole reconciliation scene with her and her sister. She says, like, you know, I was dumped. I've had to move back. This is what's, you know, there's actually bad things going on with me. Mm-hmm. But we get no hint of it, really. Right. <laughs> uh, uh, and when it comes, it doesn't feel natural. I don't it, I, I don't quite follow it. Right. Because she spent the entire movie being a really terrible human being. Yeah. Honestly. She's never shown any sort of, like, sisterly affection mm-hmm. for Jane. Ever. Not since she first got there. Yeah. Um, like that first scene is is wonderful when they're walking into the apartment together and she's telling her where everything is and they jinx each other over the strawberry Pop Tarts. Like that's a wonderful moment mm. between the two of them. And it's the last one we get until they reconcile at the end. But because of that, I don't buy the reconciliation at the end. No. You know, so she spent the whole movie ignoring Jane. Telling Jane what to do, assuming Jane is just going to take care of everything. Like, if they were really as close of sisters as the movie wants us to believe they were, Tess would have been able to see Jane's reaction to her going out with George. Like, she would not have been that oblivious. And so either she was, which means they're really not that great of sisters, or she wasn't oblivious and she did it anyway, really continuing to make her a really terrible human being. Yeah. And, uh, uh, which she is, considering how much she lied and, and all of that stuff. Mm, but. Absolutely right. And, and, and jumping through, the bit of her cutting up the mother's dress, Ugh. I don't believe she'd do that. I don't believe I don't she either. would do that without saying something, unless she is that terrible. And if she is that terrible, I don't really want to forgive her. And I'm very exactly. glad she got her comeuppance. Yes. And frankly, I love the way that comeuppance happens. I... I <laughs> Love the fact that Jane has been pushed so far to do this genuinely terrible thing. I love the Mm -hmm. way it is a gotcha on Tess. And I love that the friend points out, it's like, no, 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 no. You didn't just tell the truth about her. You brought her down. Yeah. That is good. She is called out for what she did because what she did was the nuclear option. It was absolutely the nuclear option. But sometimes, you know, that's all that's left. Yeah. When you hold it in so long that something happens and you just explode. But the way that she did it was so artful because she did, like her words were exactly what Tess told her <laughs> yeah. to say. <laughs> but yeah, it just, I like that our leading character made a mistake and, and also had a thing to apologize for from it. Mm-hmm. 
So yes, it, it, that absolutely worked. Mm-hmm. I so I don't have a sister, and so I don't know if the reconciliation was realistic or not. But it seemed like they made up way too quickly. Yeah. I mean, you have siblings. I do. I have a brother. Yeah. Um, and my brother and I once went almost a year without speaking to each other. So I kind of feel, and it was nowhere near like ruining a relationship kind of conflict, you know? And and so it just, it, it feels like they just made up way, way, way too fast. Like it would have taken more than throwing things at each other and then having some like insight into life over (laughs) you resent me, you know, I don't know. Yes. If there'd been, again, this is just one line it needs to have, but a line of, are we cool? Not yet, but we'll get there. Mm-hmm. So then when at the end we go a year later and they've made up, we're like, okay, time has passed. We're all right. But it right. feels like the film wants them to be instantly back to friends again. And I'm not sure they yes. were friends to begin with. <laughs> yeah. If if the scene in their father's hardware store, if we had been shown that it had taken place a couple weeks later or a couple months later, mm. like that would have gone a long way with me, I think. Yeah, true. Since we're actually talking about what Jane did, do you think that Jane got Pedro to say what Tess did um, <gasps> about mm. offering him its cleaning business? Or do you think he came up with that on his own because he didn't like her? I, I don't. Th- I think he came up on, with it on his own. But I had exactly that thought of like, is this her having a double hand about her? <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. like, and then someone else just to back it up. I don't think so because I don't think Jane is that manipulative, right? Or that malevolent. Um, but I also don't put it past Pedro to go. Ah, this is my opportunity to get that lie off my chest. Oops. Okay. Oh, I said it out loud. <laughs> oh dear, dearie me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, did you, were you excited when you spied Kristen Ritter? Do you care about Kristen Ritter? Uh, yes, enough to go like, oh, hey, it's Kristen Ritter. And then have a conversation of, I, I couldn't decide whether they were trying to get her to do like, dumb receptionist. Or not bothered receptionist. And I think they were going for lazy, uninterested in it. But mm-hmm. there was just an aspect of it, of doing the kind of, that stereotypically blonde, not caring. We just want a pretty face on reception. But if you want, if that's the part that's written, you don't cast Kristen Ritter. Right. Well, I think that's why. I think they cast Kristen Ritter because they wanted the opportunity to put Katherine Heigl in a goth wedding. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's really what happened. Yeah. But yeah, when she came on, I was like, I, I think if it had been just, you know, blonde Hollywood actress. I would have taken it for being, you know, she's just been put there because she's a pretty face and she should be off modeling and selling products or something. Right. I don't know. I'm being massively stereotypical there, aren't I? But you know what I mean? I mean, it's a rom-com. That's what they do. Yeah. Yeah. She didn't get much to do, though, did she? Other than no. goth wedding. Yeah. But, I mean, she was just another example of how Jane will do anything because clearly they were not friends. No. Yeah, yeah, true. You know, but Jane still planned everything for her, was still in her wedding, Mm. because Jane just can't say no, especially when it comes to weddings. I I read a thing that made a comment about, again, I was reading, there's like a 10-year retrospective on the film, um, and they said a lot of reviews at the time talked about Jane being wedding obsessed. And I can't decide, because this retrospective is from someone who loves the film, it says that's not really right, she's not wedding obsessed. She just goes to lots of weddings. She had other things. But at the same time, she does cut out those things about weddings. She does get involved right. in everyone's wedding. So there is part of it. It's like, I, I can see why that's what you take from the film. Mm-hmm. Is she wedding obsessed? Do you have a take on it? That just sounds so negative. Mm. Wedding obsessed. And I'm trying to remember. I have a line in my head that I don't know if it came from this movie or if it came from something else. Did Kevin ever say to her something about how she'd never she would never want a marriage she wants a wedding was that in this movie i think so i'm sure i saw that in the list of quotes somewhere okay um because i i do kind of feel like that's accurate it's like she i'm gonna go some i'm gonna do some psychoanalysis here some completely unqualified psychoanalysis here she they lost their mom very young and 
her completely like imagined fantasy version of her mother is centered around that photo of her mother in the Mm. wedding dress. And so in her mind, a wedding is perfection. A wedding is the thing that would bring her closer to her mom. A wedding is the thing that her mom had that made her life wonderful before she died prematurely. And so she is never giving thought to anything that comes after the wedding. And so for her, it is all about the wedding. Right. Um, I think some of that is to keep her closer to her mother. And I think some of that is because she just never grew beyond that. But I feel like saying she's wedding obsessed is just too simplistic. Yeah, it's got that implication of the keeping a journal and planning your wedding, your own wedding from age seven. And it's mm-hmm. it's not that thing. She's not obsessed with her own wedding. Right, exactly. She loves helping other people have a magical day. And she loves watching the reaction to the bride. Which is yes. absolutely true. That is one of the wonderful aspects of it, is seeing the person who knows this person the best and the one secret that is kept from them on this whole thing, what's their reaction to it? Mm -hmm. That is a very, very nice bit of writing about what they like about weddings. Yes. And and I particularly like, again, this could come across a bit contrived, but it doesn't, that we find out that's her favourite thing and then we find out it's his favourite thing in two separate conversations so that when when, when they do have the conversation together about it, it it feels much more natural. Mm Mm-hmm. Because we've learned it elsewhere previously in the film. It's nice. It's well done. Right. Mm. And, and talking about all the weddings and the, the wedding obsession and so on, I did like the delivery at the end where you then have all the bridesmaids in their bridesmaids' dresses. All the brides mm-hmm. in their bridesmaids' dresses. That's very nice. Yeah. That was... I think they did some of the writing in the movie to set that up. Like, they they figured out they wanted that ending shot yeah. before they finished the rest of the story, mm-hmm. I think. And so they kind of had to puzzle piece it in a little bit. Yeah. But it makes me happy. Because like I said earlier, the, the dresses are not actually that important to this. To, right. to the point, I feel like the film should actually be called Always a Bridesmaid. 27 Dresses but- is so specific. Right, but always a bridesmaid is so on the nose. Yeah, yeah, and I think they're That's trying fair. to not be so on the nose. That that is very fair. That is the most rom com of all time, isn't it? Because like, <laughs> and I mean, he did have the line. You know, he counted the dresses. Like that. That's how we know in the context of the movie. Yeah. that there were twenty seven dresses. Absolutely, and and the whole dress up sequence is very fun. I love the 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 montage that is all the different weddings they must have had a really fun couple of weeks putting on all these <laughs> weddings and and just right. doing those 30 second bits of shooting uh-huh but again and again and again it was probably actually quite good fun oh i imagine the whole thing was fun to shoot mm. the, the, it was fun to watch the bit that disappoints me about that ending is after all the jokes of the bridesmaid saying, oh, it'd be great, you can shorten it and use it as an actual dress, and that's never true. It's a shame that the bridesmaids at the end, the, the, the like legit bridesmaids, her bridesmaids, are not actually put in dresses they could use again. And and different dresses that suit each of them differently. Mm. Like, And I have, you know, all her time as a bridesmaid has, has made her learn. I actually just put them in nice dresses and they can stand next to me. Great. They were... Okay, so maybe they weren't dresses that you would really wear again, but they weren't themed, they weren't flamboyant, they were simply styled. That's true. As opposed to all of the other ones. Yeah. It feels like a missed opportunity. To That's to, fair. to show like, oh, and she is the best of them. Where, where, mm-hmm. Whether she is or not, we don't know. Shall we talk about our favorite moments? We shall. We are talking about the good stuff. And there is a lot of good stuff in here, like... As much as it is a, a, and you said this was going to be the most traditional rom-com on our list, and it Mm -hmm. is, I I still think it does it well. And I think it has layers of potentially good stuff that, although it doesn't deliver on, is still interesting. Yes. Um, I, like I said up top, a lot of this is from Catherine Heigl's performance. I really enjoyed Catherine Heigl in this. I think she is, she's kinetic. She's always moving and always doing something with her expression, with her arms. The, the, seeing her trying to force all the dresses into the cupboard and close the door on the wardrobe and the doors coming open behind her and so on. It's really mm-hmm. funny. It's really good. It's <laughs> reminiscent of Steve Martin 
and when I've talked about him and his that sort of physicality, he knows what his arms are doing and what he's always moving at every time. Right. I mean, she's not Steve Martin. <laughs> Let's just make sure that's clear. <laughs> but, she, but she does do give a really good performance. And I, I feel like when I see her up against the, the men of the film, she's almost combative with how good she's trying to be. I can imagine they had really good read-throughs and really good moments and like practicing and stuff, and then they're on, and she's just doing these expressions and stealing the scene that she's in, as as the lead woman should do. But everyone else going, oh, I need to do something else, and she's left no air in the room for me to do anything. Right. Which is perhaps why all the other performances, I go, oh, no one else stepped up, did they? <laughs> okay. Yeah, no, that is absolutely fair. Mm. I mean, she is absolutely engaging and when she is on screen she is where your eyes are yeah i i I think it particularly came across the bar scene when before the karaoke uh her and jay's marston and she's just constantly moving moving things around on the side and looking around and talking being expressive so he's having to be quite still he is not like if he did that they would just look a bit manic right so so it stands out even more that she's doing impressive stuff and, I, and yeah, it's great. It's really enjoyable all the time she's doing it. I think yeah. I think the thing that then stood out, because the main actors didn't have much that they could do, some of the extras, particularly that end scene where she leaps onto the boat, which is a really nice stunt. She leaps onto the boat um, and confesses her love to him. There's a few extras in that scene that just absolutely drew my attention. That w- when she's talking to him and the spotlight goes on him, there's a waiter who goes behind him like trying to offer buffet stuff. And you think, did that extra just go, I'm going to get in this scene. I'm going to do this. Every single take, I'm going to walk across. <laughs> <laughs> I have to be honest, I didn't notice. It just seems everyone else on that ship has stopped and is focusing on what they're doing. This waiter, however. Hey, anyone want a spring roll? Spring roll. Egg roll? Egg roll? You want an egg roll? <laughs> and then when they finally come together and they kiss or hug, I can't even remember what they did. But the bride of this event is stood with her husband, sort of, and she shushes him, like, no, no, I want to watch this. And then she whispers in his ear to tell him what's going on. And then she goes back to watching. Uh This girl is in her own film and her own wedding and has got a whole character piece set up and is just (laughs) in the very top of the shot. And again, I can't decide whether it's these are really good choices and really engaging and it makes the scene better or... The scene is so traditional and not interesting <laughs> that the extras are sort of making up for it. Okay. Ma- right. Maybe a bit of both. <laughs> <laughs> and we mentioned the scene where the dress gets cut up. Mm-hmm. I do really enjoy that. I think it is so heartbreaking. And it is, I, I think they do have to have the, the sister go a, a step too far at some point. I'm not sure this is the step she should go, but it is done very well. Um, the, the scene that Jane gives her about it, the, the line that Jane gives her about it, it's a really good line. I feel like Catherine Heigl just throws it away a little bit. I feel like she could, really? she could say it and just let it land and look at her and then walk away. But she says it almost as she's turning away and it's just... No, this is your moment of standing up to her, and it doesn't. I, 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 oh, I feel like it's just missing some some punch to it. Oh, see, I think her walking away is the punch mm. because she never does. She never says no, even when she's asked to do something completely ridiculous that she wants to say no to. She stands there and she does it. She never walks away, Mm-mm. and in this moment, she walked away. And she got to have the last line. Yeah. That is very fair. And and yeah, the, the thing of not looking back at the explosion as yeah. it's going on behind you. Yeah, very fair, actually. It is a great line. Yeah, I'm yeah, I'm with you. That's actually my favorite line from the movie. Okay. It's it's so hard. Like it's heartbreaking, like you said. Um and it's so unexpected. And and from the character, I did think it was going to be your your favorite line, so I've not given it. So you can go ahead. Oh, that's true. You didn't actually say it. Um, Tess said something like, "You wouldn't dare hurt me because I'm your sister." And Jane, you know, walks away. And then as she's talking, she looks at her and says, "That was yesterday. Today, you're just the bitch who broke my heart and cut up my mother's wedding dress." And then she walks out the door. That's so good. It's, it, it is a really good line. 
Yeah. Yeah, it is a really mm. good line. And and that is the sort of quality from something like a Devil Wears, Devil Wears Prada. Mm-hmm. Like, that's the sort of thing that the writer brings to this. Um, really cutting and biting stuff. Yeah, yeah. There was some lighthearted stuff that I liked, too. Oh, yeah, go on. Um, when Jane finds out that Kevin Doyle is actually the Malcolm Doyle who writes the uh, wedding announcements that she's so enamored with, yeah. she says, I feel like I just found out my favorite love song was written about a sandwich. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's good. That's such a good analogy. Mm. You know, because you can just understand how, like, it just feels inside to be let down, you know? Yeah. Um, and then I think the most romantic line in the movie was when Kevin says to her, I think you deserve more than what you settle for. That's good. It's a, it's a good line. Mm. Um, and I really, really like, usually in rom-coms, you get one grand gesture. And usually that grand gesture is the guy trying to get the girl. Yeah. And in this one, they both had grand gestures, although hers was bigger. Mm-hmm. Um, he shows up at the engagement party rehearsal dinner whatever it is um because simply because he knew it was going to be hard for her like he knows that she's mad at him that he betrayed her trust and he still shows up for her and then he gives her a gift and says i think you deserve more than what you settled for you know all of those things together to me that is maybe not a grand gesture but a great gesture Mm. you know it's it's him stepping forward and then we also have her grand gesture at the end where she goes to find him and then she jumps the ramp to get on the boat that's leaving and, you know, stands up on Mike in front of a boat full of strangers to declare her love for him. Um, I love it. They both had a grand gesture and it just wasn't completely one-sided. Yeah. And, and I do love that stunt where she gets on the boat. She jumps across, you know, well, mm-hmm. well done to the stunt lady, obviously. But then Catherine Heigl takes a step and falls over. <laughs> it was very reminiscent of Sandra Bullock and Miss Congeniality. Yes, yeah. Walking in heels, mm. yeah. And even like the way that she popped up, the physicality of it was yeah, very yeah. similar. Um, now, but very good. Yeah, there's a leading lady performance. Yes. Mm. Yeah. The the bit with the water glasses. Oh, love it. <laughs> uh, before we finish up the show, we want to say thank you very much to everyone who gave us comments about rom coms. Um, lots of really good ones. Look, look, uh, I really enjoyed both that there are so many different opinions and that everyone has different rom-coms that, that they love. I don't think there were any duplications on all the sort of, this is one I love, this is one I love. Right. You know, it, it, the, you love Pretty Woman. Uh, Jen liked uh, Runaway Bride. I mean, I like Runaway Bride too. Yeah. It just didn't make but not, my not one you say is a favorite. It. It's just you know different yeah. things of it, different aspects of it stand out, and I can see why this is going to be someone's favorite because someone would look at this and go, "It helped me understand that I said yes and had this sort of attitude to things." Right. When when yeah. done well, it can deliver some good stuff. Um, if you do want to join in the conversation, we always uh, put out about what we're recording so you can uh, see what's coming up, give us your thoughts on what we're talking about, and you can use the hashtag PC Deprived on Twitter. Uh, we are on Twitter and Facebook, and we're on Instagram. We are at Eloquent Gushing. And if you want to email us, you can drop an email to podcast at eloquentgushing.com, or you can leave a voice message at speakpipe.com slash eloquentgushing. And Pop Culturally Deprived is 100% funded by listeners just like you through our Patreon page. So any amount that you can give, even just $1 a month, will give you access to exclusive content and also helps to support us and the new shows that we would like to develop and the shows that we're currently doing now. So to find out more, please visit patreon.com slash eloquentgushing. And if you want to know more about all of the shows that we are doing, um, we have several that are going on right now, um, please go to our webpage, eloquentgushing.com. And we'll be back next week with another episode where we'll talk about 13 going on 30. So until next time, I'm Mandy Kay. And I need you to give me 50 bucks. Pop Culturally Deprived is an eloquent gushing production. For more information, go to eloquentgushing.com or find us on Twitter at eloquentgushing.